Hi everyone and welcome back to LearnNeuroradiology.com. I'm Brent Weinberg. I'm here to give you part six of the FAST10 Neuroradiology Review Cases. We've already seen 50 other cases. We're going to cover cases 51 through 60 here. We're going to spend about one minute per case. I'll show you a couple of images. I'll ask you a multiple choice question. Then we'll go through the answer and I'll explain to you some of the reasons why the answer is what it is. So without further ado, let's hop right in. So case number 51 is a 35 year old woman with dizziness, nausea, vomiting, and seizure. Got a couple of images from a CT here, a couple of images from an MRI, and a T2 and a post contrast. Your choices are cysticercosis, contusion, posterior reversible encephalopathy or press, or oligodendroglioma. So this is a case of cysticercosis. If you take a look at the CT, you've got some calcification here with some edema around it. If you take a look at this, you have additional areas of calcification here posteriorly. And in the MR, you have a peripherally enhancing lesion with some edema around it that's partially calcified. That's a classic for neurocystisarcosis. This is the most common cause of acquired seizure in Latin America. So it's very common in the south, uh, southwest U.S. where there's a large Hispanic population. Uh, a lot of times you'll have some peripheral enhancement. There's various stages of this disease that you can see in various charts. We won't cover it here. Uh, but the best clue in this case was the other calcified nodules in the brain that made you think there have been previous episodes of granulomatous disease or neurocystisarcosis. Case number 52 is a 32-year-old woman with a questionable history of meningitis and right vision loss. If you look at these images, maybe the history is not so questionable. Definitely something going on there. Got a T2 and a post-contrast kind of through the orbits. Your choices are esthesioneuroblastoma, squamous cell carcinoma, sarcoidosis, or AV malformation or AVM. This is a case of sarcoidosis. It's probably one of the worst cases of sarcoidosis I've ever seen. What you have here is you've got some nodules. Some of them are in the parenchyma. You've got leptomeningeal enhancement. The nodules are kind of faintly T2 hypointense, which is very common for sarcoidosis or granulomatous disease like TB. You'll also note that you have involvement of the orbit. So you've got enhancing disease extending along the optic nerve. When you see leptomeningeal disease, uh, particularly with involvement of the orbit, you want to think about sarcoidosis. Now, your main differential is leptomeningeal cancer, uh, which you could have in this case if the history were correct, or other unusual infections, so unusual pathogens like tuberculosis or fungi. All right, case number 53, 83-year-old man, atrial fibrillation treated with warfarin or Coumadin. Got two CT images, one in a brain window, one in a bone window. Your choices are meningioma, subdural hematoma, epidural hematoma, or lymphoma. Quick look here, we'll give you the answer. All right, so your answer here is a subdural hematoma. So here you'll see a little bit of an explanation. You've got an extra axial hematoma here. It does have a little bit of that lens shape like you might see with an epidural hematoma. But if you look, it kind of wraps around even more and sort of continues to, to wrap around here like a crescent. You'll also see that it crosses the expected region of the coronal suture and there's no fracture. It's very uncommon to have epidural hematomas without a fracture. Also, subdurals are much more common. So I kind of wanted you to take a look at the variable appearance of subdural hematomas and be aware that they can uh, kind of cross over with the appearance of epidural hematomas. Case number 54 is a 30-year-old man with seizure and altered mental status. You've got some images here from an MRI. You've got an axial flare, an axial post-contrast. Your choices are low-grade astrocytoma, DNET, ganglioglioma, or limbic encephalitis. So this is a case of limbic encephalitis. What you have here is you've got bilateral T2 abnormality in the hippocampi. They look swollen, they're T2 bright. It's pretty symmetric and there's no enhancement. Now the fact that it's so symmetric makes it less likely to be a tumor. The fact that it's not enhancing that much and it's so symmetric makes it less likely to be herpes. Uh, so this makes this limbic encephalitis. Now this is an auto, uh, autoimmune or inflammatory encephalitis often associated with uh, other malignancy or with malignancy. So the patient may have a tumor. And, uh, but you can see this uh, pretty frequently. This will be a classic appearance of limbic encephalitis. Case number 55 is a 17 year old with left upper extremity weakness. I have images from a CT with contrast here, like looks pretty arterially timed. 
your choices are lymphatic malformation, arteriovenous malformation, lymphoma, or Rosai Dorfman disease. This is a case of arteriovenous malformation of the soft tissues of the left neck. If you take a look, you've got this multi lobulated kind of curvilinear structure. It's very enhancing, like it looks very bright, very close to the arteries, although in this case it's pretty venous uh, as well. Uh, but you've got a lot of curvilinear abnormal enhancing vessels here that enhance early. That's a sort of classic for an AV malformation or high flow vascular malformation. Now, venous malformations and lymphatic malformations can have a similar appearance, but they usually won't have this appearance of anitis like this. Lymphatic malformations usually don't enhance at all. Uh, Rosai Dorfman disease is a lymphat uh, lymphadenopathy, and you don't see much of that here. Uh, so when you see flow voids or abnormal tangle of vessels here in the superficial soft tissues, think vascular malformation. If you see high flow, think about arteriovenous malformation. Case number 56 is a 30 year old status post trauma. Got a flare and SWI or blood sensitive imaging here. Are your choices are subarachnoid hemorrhage, fat emboli, cerebral amyloid angiopathy, or traumatic shear injury. This is a case of traumatic shear injury or sometimes will be referred to as diffuse axonal injury. Uh, what you see here on the flare is you've got multifocal abnormalities, like mostly in a subcortical distribution, so kind of at the gray-white interface. And on SWI, you see there are numerous hemorrhages throughout the brain parenchyma. So those are little areas where the tissue has been torn and there's been microhemorrhage. Here you see in the corona radiata some kind of linear injury along vessels adjacent to the corpus callosum here. These are sequela of shear injury and often a wee high energy trauma with rotational forces of car accidents, ATV accidents, of blunt blows to the head. Uh, common locations are around the corpus callosum and the gray white junction. Now this susceptibility weighted imaging really helps you see the full extent of disease. Now this patient's too young for amyloid disease. Uh, you usually wouldn't have all these uh, kind of additional micro hemorrhages. Uh, so that's why you think this is probably a case of traumatic axonal injury. Case number 57 is a 60 year old with acute onset right frontal soft tissue swelling. Images from a CT. Your choices are lymphoma, sinusitis and osteomyelitis, squamous cell carcinoma, or mucosal. This is a case of sinusitis osteomyelitis, or as it's sometimes referred to in this location, a POTS puffy tumor. What you have is you have infection of the frontal sinus. There's been breakthrough or destruction of the bone of the anterior margin of the frontal sinus with it extending into the frontal soft tissues. Now, mucosal usually causes like a much smoother remodeling of the bone. So that's usually not going to be the case here. Uh, but this is classic for kind of infection and extending out of the frontal sinus or POTS puffy tumor. Case number 58 is a 46-year-old woman with left-sided headache, neck pain, and Horner syndrome. That history is almost enough for you to get the answer. But here you have some MIP, Im or MIP image from an MRA and this MR image through the neck. Your choices are left vertebral dissection, left carotid dissection, carotid body paraganglioma, or schwannoma. This is a case of left carotid dissection. What you see this second image that I showed you here is a fat saturated T1 weighted image. That's kind of the classic uh, gold standard to look for dissections in the neck because what you'll see is met hemoglobin in the uh, margin in the wall of the vessel here in a crescent shaped. You can see a little bit of tapering of this vessel on the MRA here, but it's really the crescent shaped met hemoglobin along the wall of the vessel that gives it away. If you look at the left vertebral artery, it's normal. Uh, masses typically don't look like this because they won't have this crescent shape. They'll be more rounded like a mass. Case number 59 is a 40 year old with neck swelling and low grade fever. You have axial image through the neck, coronal image through the lungs. Your choices are Rosai Dorfman disease, lymphoma, tuberculosis, or sarcoidosis. This is the classic appearance of tuberculosis of the neck or scrofula. Uh, what you see here is you've got a fluid collection with peripheral enhancement here, but necrosis. Sometimes you'll see it draining to the skin. I showed you the lungs so you can see that there's simultaneous pulmonary disease. You see these tree and bud nodules in the left upper lung. Uh, so when you see uh, necrotic lymphadenopathy in the neck with uh, associated lung disease, think about tuberculous uh, lymphadenitis, or in this case, uh, it's sometimes called scrofula. 
All right, we've made it to the end. There's one question left in this set. This question does not have any images. Your question is, if a patient with serious concern for called equina syndrome cannot undergo MRI, what is the next best test of choice? Is it PET-CT? Is it lumbar radiographs? Is it non-contrast CT lumbar spine? Or is it whole body bone scan? So the answer to this is a non-contrast CT of the lumbar spine. This is a question about the ACR appropriateness criteria. So if you think about patients who have low back pain, suspected called equina syndrome, you really your best test is to do an MRI of the lumbar spine either with or without contrast. Let's say if a patient can't get it because they have an in, incompatible device, then uh, you, your next tests are either to do a lumbar spine without contrast, so that's probably the most common because it's non-invasive, doesn't require a procedure, or a CT myelogram of the lumbar spine. Most other tests are not likely to help. And so on, particularly on the ABR exams, be aware of these appropriateness criteria for common things, headache, abdominal pain, uh, you know, back pain. These are uh, pretty low hanging fruit for questions. You probably know them from your practice, but it's good to review them before the exam. All right, thanks to everyone for tuning in. If you haven't seen the other 50 cases, I encourage you to go back and check them out. Check out the website, which has all of the cases sorted by a body location. Uh, you can search them there and find diagnoses that you want to see, or you can find longer explanations to the cases that we're seeing here. Thanks for tuning in. Everybody, good luck on your exams, and uh, thanks for tuning into the channel. Check out the website. I appreciate you being here, and uh, be sure to check back in for new videos uh, frequently. Thanks.